I think it's fair to say that Labour's anti-Semitism row isn't going away any time soon, especially after one of its longest-serving MPs likened the party's disciplinary investigation to Nazi Germany, or so it seemed. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn today refused to answer questions on the controversy after becoming involved in a row last month with Dame Margaret Hodge. Well, for more than this, we're joined by the co-founder of Navarra Media, Aaron Vistani. And always lovely to see you. And um, what is, can we just start with the, the very straightforward question, what is the charge uh, laid at the door of, of Margaret Hodge in all of this? Well, it's subjective, isn't it? I watched the interview yesterday and what I heard was a comparison of her experience to that of 1930s Germany. She explicitly said this, I thought to myself, this must be what it felt like. She compared Labour supporters and party members and activists, the very people who helped her win her seat again in 2017. She compared them to the supporters of Donald Trump and Boris Johnson. And she compared her experience, the investigation into her, to McCarthyism. So I heard a series of increasingly absurd propositions. I, I just want to be absolutely clear, clear as to your argument. You, you tweeted something earlier on, and I'm, 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 we're not springing this on you. These, these are your Fine, words, yeah, but, in, but involving Beth Rigby, our, our deputy yeah, yeah, political course. editor. I just want to put it up. Um, it was basically posing two questions uh, to both um, Beth Rigby and, and Dan Hodges, the com political commentator. Hi, Omer. Actual Holocaust survivor, racist to compare Israel's treatment of Palestine to 1930s mm -hmm. Germany. And then the second question, who are we to judge uh, Margaret Hodge when she compares a, a disciplinary letter um, to the Holocaust? Mm. Now, uh, first and foremost, I mean, when, when, it ever, uh, when has Beth Rigby ever said that High Mayor was, was racist? That was, a, that was a, a central pivot of the mainstream media's coverage of the anti-Semitism crisis for the best part of a week. If you want, I mean, you've, you've said this to me now in a, in a studio, I'm happy to come back on tomorrow and I'll be incredibly well researched. If you want, I can give you five minutes. No, 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 it's just and my I can talk, my, no, I'm trying to understand talk, the argument. I can argument. talk very substantive. Well, but, 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 but Beth Rigby has never said the words there. Well, Hail Mayer uh, well, was, you, a, no, was no, a racist. No, what you've done to me is you, your research has asked me to come in to talk mm -hmm. about Margaret Hodges' words. You've then sprung this on me. But, Again, we're reproducing a cycle here, a vicious cycle, which means that the public aren't particularly well informed. And I think the Margaret Hodgins yesterday spoke to that because this is a person who's in public office, she's a member of parliament, she's meant to elevate the debate and instead she said the most ridiculous, bizarre things and people should hold her to a very high standard because she's a very important person. The, the point simply was, I mean, is your argument in that tweet that it is somewhat hypocritical on the one hand for some people to say that under the era definition, Hayo Mayer would be anti-Semitic for the comments that he's made, but Margaret Hodge wouldn't be anti-Semitic when she compares that disciplinary letter to the Holocaust. Is, me, that, is that the argument? Me, my I, I, personal view is this. It's clearly deeply inappropriate for anybody uh, to compare a Jewish person to a Nazi or to... Um, stigmatise or make fun of or make comical gestures around somebody's experience. Mm -hmm. Clearly, Margaret Hodge, I'm sure, lost loved ones in the Holocaust. Hugely important issue. But yes, there does seem to me to be a double standard where Hajo Meyer had his name taken through the mud for days on end. Somebody who actually was in the Holocaust in concentration camps and survived. And yet somebody, I think, says something quite ridiculous, which is that a letter from the Labour Party is equivalent to 1930s Germany, is given a free pass. And to me that shows a fundamental point, which is that the media wants to use this issue, and there is some truth to obviously elements of it, mm -hmm. clearly people have said anti-Semitic things, but the media is interested in it primarily because it's a tool to attack Jeremy Corbyn. Okay, Nothing more. Can, can we then just, um, uh, Andrew, I wonder if we can just get the two, the, the, two, the points in the interview where um, Margaret Hodge, the, the comments that, that, yeah. that seem to have caused the fraud, I just want to play those um, uh, to, here's the first part. On the day that I heard that they were going to discipline me and possibly suspend me, it felt almost like I kept thinking, what did it feel like to be a mm. Jew in Germany in the 30s? Now that's, the, that's the first part, but then yeah. she then went on to say that the Labour Party's decision to open disciplinary proceedings against her, it took her back to some comments that, that, yeah. that our father made, and we just want to play that as well. He always said to me as a child, you've got to keep a packed suitcase at the door, Margaret, in case you ever have to leave in a hurry. And when I heard about the disciplinary, my emotional response resonated with that feeling of fear that clearly was at the heart of what my father felt. Now, I understand your perspective on things, but when I listen to that, I do not hear Margaret Hodge saying the disciplinary, pro comparing the disciplinary process to the Holocaust. No, she said her experience of receiving that letter, the disciplinary process being initiated, 
she draws a clear equivalence between that and how a, a German Jew would have felt in the 1930s. No, she says it resonates. She's not saying that the Labour Party are going to round up Jews and put them into camps. Well, she I'm, is I saying that... I don't think anybody's saying that. I said, I, my precise word just mm -hmm. then was an equivalence, which, by the way, if we're talking about the IHRA, is exactly the kind of language that is uh, focused upon. So I think it's... F for me, uh, I think it's... Uh, I think it's almost... How can I put this? It's belittling the experience. It makes it a, a, a political frivolity. The Holocaust was, without doubt, the greatest tragedy of the 20th century, a century defined by tragedy. Mm -hmm. You know, a letter from the Labour Party saying you've used quite uh, ugly language with the party leader, it's not in the same mental universe. But, but who, who are you? Oh, and, and Chris who Williamson are any of us? and Jeremy Who are any of us? Jeremy it's my opinion. Any, any, but this is the thing. But who are you to tell a second generation Holocaust survivor not to feel afraid? I'm not saying don't feel afraid. I'm saying do not compare. Well, that's what she was talking about. I mean, it's, this isn't part of the problem in all of this, in this discussion, is that the vast majority of people in the United Kingdom, and I don't know whether you're part of this number, so I'm not going to include you in it, but the vast majority of people in the UK have not had their father tell them, in all seriousness, to keep a packed bag by the front door well, because they might my, have to leave it in a woman's My grandmother's notice. an Iranian Jew, and I can tell you there are 100,000 of them in Iran. They don't have easy lives. So uh, many people, you know, Armenians, of British Jews, people from around the world, various diaspora communities, her words will resonate with them, and I can understand entirely what she's saying. But the focus of this, this discussion around the IHRA mm -hmm. really is around that one example. And what I would say is, yes, those words in a way are actually very important. What you're saying is very important. So let's apply it also to the Palestinian people. We're talking about the right to national self-determination. We're talking about the right to express and articulate a struggle which has defined not just you, but previous generations. Yeah. Those people that Jeremy Corbyn went to see in Tunis, they can't be buried in their own homeland. They can't be buried in their homeland. He then goes to a cemetery to lay a wreath, and he is made to be a, a villain are you, are by you the entirely national happy, media though? for days on end. Are you entirely happy, though, and with the way in which the, the, the hashtag, the Hodge comparisons hashtag, has gone today? I mean, I mean just a quick, the quickest of glances through it. <laughs> My teenage son and I were allocated one seat for, away from each other on a Ryanair flight. He couldn't reach his Pringles. From that moment on, he knew exactly how his African ancestors felt when they were forcibly separated in the transatlantic slave trade. At school, when I was 13, I was shown a diagram of a male reproductive appendage in my biology class. I realise now that the trauma I experienced was akin to that suffered by children in Islington care homes in the 1980s. I mean, these are jokes that are being directed at a woman who you may disagree with her interpretation of events, you may even disagree <clears throat> with her fear of, you know, the fear that she expressed. <clears throat> but we're talking about, you know, we're making jokes to someone whose family members died yeah. in the Holocaust. Yeah, I mean, we can, we can obviously point at stupid things that people have said on Twitter all day. I mean, day. I'm happy to hear you say that that is stupid. Yeah, of course. We, we, could, we, you know, we could probably dedicate a whole, a whole you know, TV network to it. But fundamentally, and I'll, I'll re return to the original point, this is not a frivolous thing. Anti-Semitism, racism is not a frivolous thing. She, later on in that interview, says that, oh, well, I thought maybe this complaint has come in because I'm Jewish, and she compared it to McCarthyism. And that's a hugely important thing to say. And if she sincerely believes that, we have to have an, we have to have an investigation. No, 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 really. This, is, this would be a crisis of one of the most important political institutions in this country if she really believes this. So I say we can't say these things lightly. And what I think that hashtag was generally was a frivolous and silly response to what people perceive to be mm -hmm frivolous and silly comments. But do you understand that why the, there are those in the Jewish community this evening who, who obviously, for obvious reasons, will not be able to appear on, on, this, on yeah. this channel? You hear the comments of Chris Williamson, you know, someone who's very close to this... What did he say? He, he, yeah, indeed, sorry. What well, did he, he, has, he, has, he's acu <laughs> he has accused, yeah. you know, someone who is a second-generation second Holocaust survivor of weaponising the Holocaust. So, I mean... I mean, do you know, is, there, is there no point at which you think, do you know what, even if I disagree with Margaret Hodge, perhaps it might not be best for people like Chris Williamson, particularly given that there has been an admission at the highest levels in the Labour <laughs> Party, that there is, to a degree, and we can debate the degree, a problem with anti-Semitism, yeah. that it is probably not the best thing to do to speak to someone who has had that experience, who's talked honestly about that experience, and accuse them of weaponising the Holocaust. I mean, it's deeply offensive. Well, I mean, that's... That's Chris Williamson's opinion. My opinion would be we need to take very seriously those feelings and say, like I say, extend them to the Palestinian people. They have been completely invisibilised in this whole conversation. 
711,000 people were expelled from Palestine between 1944 and 1948. 300 Brits died in Palestine before 1948. Prince Harry was in Jerusalem, I think, in June. Didn't say a word. You had diplomats uh, being assassinated. You had a, a British uh, ambassador assassinated in 1944 by the Lehi, by a terrorist organisation. None of this is talked about. And yet Jeremy Corbyn goes to lay a wreath that people that can't be buried in their homeland and they're called terrorists by Israel with no evidence. They were killed in an extrajudicial killing without a, a trial or without a jury. Mm -hmm. And yet him laying a wreath there makes him the bad guy. I think most people look at that and say, this doesn't add up to me. This doesn't look right. And it mm -hmm. isn't right. When, when you've got people like, like Len McCluskey now saying, actually, do you know what? I think the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition and examples needs to be uh, put mm. in to the Labour Code of Conduct mm. in full. Mm. I mean, what does that mean for kind of people like you who have been very, very critical of mm. that because of those examples which were dropped, you know, about the, the you know, the, that, that a state of Israel is a racist endeavour, mm. that comparisons with Nazi Germany are prima facie racist. I mean, if they adopt the full definition, what does that mean for all the work that you've done, uh, all the complaints that you've made about the definition itself? I, I, my grievance in regards to the IHRA is not the definition which was, was accepted in 2016, um, in the recent Code of Conduct, eight of those 11 we had this conversation before were accepted wholesale. The politically contentious one is the one around, uh, is it a state of Israel or the state of Israel being a racist endeavour? Now, what Palestinian activists tell me is that this has and will continue to um, obstruct them in their pursuit of justice. And so I have, to, I have to subordinate myself to them. I have to listen to them. That's what they're telling me in good faith. And so my complaint is we had a compromise originally. Do, do you think, though, that the Board of Deputies is not acting in good faith? Do you think no, no. that the Jewish Chronicle is not acting no, in good faith? The, Jewish News not no, acting in good not faith? Not, Jewish Telegraph? I'm not, I'm not saying it's not good faith. I'm sure there's a, there's a great deal of ambiguity and mixed feelings and people are unsure about intentions and motives and all sorts. What I'm saying is the original Code of Conduct, which should have been put out as a, as a consultation, had the definition verbatim. Eight of those 11 examples repeated verbatim. And so it comes down to this, just one of these examples. And people are saying, well, we need to have a compromise. We had a compromise. It wasn't like Labour said, you know what, we're going to create our own definition of anti-Semitism, all our own examples. There was a compromise. And the people that advanced that compromise were called racists, anti-Semites, bigots. So that doesn't sound to me like an educated adult conversation that takes racism seriously. Unlike the adult educated conversation that you and I have Always just had. Always with you now. Aaron, thanks very much for joining us. Appreciate it.